Um, and I was there for 10 years. And um, as, of, as of last year, I was the chief editor. And then something happened, uh, something that is quite um, common for Ukrainian media landscape. And that is the owner of the King Post, who is a wealthy businessman who was kind of sponsoring the key post for, you know, kind of to, to you know, for, for his profile, basically. Um, he decided that he is done having programs that come with, um, you know, owning an independent media output in Ukraine. We know from all sources that um, there has been pressure from the Secretary General's office on him because of how critical coverage of the government. Mm -hmm. And um, so what he did, he handled it pretty badly. He fired uh, the whole staff overnight um, in early November last year. So we were, you know, uh, the key post was up to 50 people and 30 of them, 30 to 35 and journalists. Um, so we were a newsroom of people who suddenly were without, without a newspaper, without a website, without anything to, to do. And uh, we faced a very simple choice, which is to pursue different, um, you know, directions. We all were very employable in Ukraine. We all got like, job offers on the first day after the key post was um, shut down and we were fired. And uh, the second option was to kind of not, not give up and uh, we called it not to let the bad guys win. Um, and actually we'll start um, a new publication with no money, with, with a hope to, you know, to be able to find ourselves um, and to, you know, we just we really believe that there needs to be something like the Cape Post, something like that, um, a local media outlet that publishes in English, but is bringing the local perspective that is run by Ukrainians, that is bringing a local perspective to the world from the news in Ukraine. Um, because, of course, Ukraine is covered by you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, and so on. Um, but we believe that we can bring something different to the mix, which is, you know, the, the local expertise, local knowledge, and something that you don't necessarily get from um, what we sometimes call as parachute journal. But it's also not that we believe that it's needed. Uh, the community also reached out to, to us and people ask us for, you know, to launch something because a lot of businesses were, you know, like international Ukrainian businesses, international businesses based in Ukraine and stuff, they relied on the information from the Kiev Post to, to do their business. And for them, it was a big loss, a very practical loss, you know, for that matter. It wasn't just about independent journalists for them. It was also about, you know, the business needs they had to, to cover and the loss of the main source. Yeah, because the audience of the Kiev Post was, um, always included a lot of people who were decision makers who were you know who needed to follow news about Ukraine you know on a on a on a deeper level than what is brought to them by the New York Times because of their work because they're with some think tank or with a, a company that does business in Ukraine or so on. Um, so yeah, so um, we were a team of thirty people who had no idea how to fund this how to find the money to to uh, you know, start this this new publication. We only had this idea, that idealistic idea that that we need to move on. And we were actually told, you know, privately by people that you guys are just being kids. You guys are being naive. This is how things are done in Ukraine. You know, you want you you need to like make peace with the owner, come back, and um, you know, basically start covering the government in a different way. Because this is like, you know, this is the way things are run. Like that's what we were told. But we didn't believe that this is how things need to be run and uh, we want to do something different. Um, but we didn't know how. So that's that's when uh, genomic media consultancy uh, stepped in and that's where the can can uh, uh, yeah. explain how we... No, I, I myself was a reporter at the Key Post starting 2011 until 2017, I think. And then I left to do other things. I essentially left into media management. I ran another company to, as a manager, last week when the journalist or editor. Um, and, you know, by the time this happened, I was a genomics media consultancy. That was a, also a startup in media consultancy focused on media only. And uh, actually ran by, you know, three partners. Two of those were Keep Post alumni. 
because Kilpos was also kind of, you know, um, this alma mater for a lot of English speaking media professionals in Ukraine. Um, so when this happened, we were shocked uh, because, you know, I thought Kilpos will always be there, but it didn't quite happen that way. So um, I messaged uh, Olga was in Chicago back then, and they messaged people I knew in the newsroom um, and offered help. If you guys need, you know, our help, we are ready to help. And from then on, it everything happened very quickly. So we understood that we had like two and a half months before the Christmas break comes in, and everything's become just, you know becomes irrelevant for the rest of the world. <laughs> and uh, yeah, a month and a half. Yeah, a month and a half. Yeah. So we we had a couple of discussions, and uh, so the team was fired on Monday, and on Saturday we already decided to start a new company together. Genomics and the Kipos editorial team. We um, started figuring out a lot of details as you know as we go. Uh, we all had interim roles. We were running this, you know fundraising, but also trying to start all these editorial products. I think the first thing we started was the uh, newsletter, the daily newsletter. You probably, some of you receive it still at Ukraine Daily. Um, when we started Ukraine Daily, we didn't have a website or anything, you know, it was just the newsletter. Um, and I think on the same week, at the end of the week, we started our first podcast called uh, Media and Congress. That was a reality show of what you know, we are doing, kind of trying to do it. Once you're uh, going depth look and everything that we're talking about, you can listen to uh, Media and Progress. It's just... Uh, it's finished and, already. And full effect is a like a short yeah. season. It's pretty cool. I love it, actually. It has a lot of insight. It also has the, um, the, the voice from, like, the beginning of... Uh, of um, it, it has the recording from this final staff meeting at the key post where everybody's fired. So that's very touchy. Um, yeah, so yeah, somebody recorded it, of course, the real the key <laughs> Um, and um, yeah, so we started doing stuff, and you know, from the business perspective, we started fundraising, but you would think that donors would be jumping at the opportunity to fund us, but not, not really, you know. Um, <laughs> everyone was like. Yeah, you know, like this is another one, dollar funded media side, probably not very much needed. So uh, we had to convince them. And, you know, the whole idea wasn't to be dollar funded. The idea was to be sustainable. So to make money, to, you know, uh, to be a good business for once. Um, we started uh, our membership program on Patreon. Uh, Patreon is not the best idea, but we didn't have the website. So we didn't have anywhere to attach it, uh, you know, on the native platform. Um, we essentially waited until we had the name. I'll tell you the story of the name, but that's a you know a different situation. And then we started the GoFundMe campaign at the same time. Uh, we also started working with the advertising. Um, and you know a lot of people. And we started looking for investors as well. A lot of investors were very skeptical about what we were doing, telling me you know like you pick one revenue stream. That's why yeah you know that's only how it can work. Um, but you know, I'm from Ukraine, so I know that in Ukraine you don't pick one revenue stream because something's gonna happen, it will crash, and people, you know, will be left without nothing, you know, anything. And uh, so we did it. We went for pretty much every revenue stream that media can go for. We had a membership model, we had crowdfunding campaign, we had commercial revenues, we had syndication revenues, uh, and we had some donor funding. Uh, when we launched our Patreon, it's actually going very quickly as for the Ukrainian media because in Ukraine we don't have the habit of paying for news or paying for content or information as such. Um, so all the crowdfunding campaigns for media go, you know, pretty slowly, uh, unless there is a crisis that kind of pushes it up. But um, but donors were impressed how dynamic ours was, and they actually committed to some funding. And that's how we, we got our first runway. So we got money to cover essentially like half a year of you know our life within a year ago. Um yeah, and then you know, we're still very minimum budget, the shoestring budget. We yeah. had like one year cover this shoestring budget that was the start of the year. Yeah, and of course we, we didn't we couldn't afford to leave all the 35 people with the editorial team of the team posting. So uh some people left on their own, some people we, we have to give them up because we just couldn't afford it. Uh, so we were a very tight team, like just the essential team on the editorial side and 
essentially one and a half person on the managerial side. Which together was like 23 people or whatever. Yeah. 22, 23 people. Yeah, so that, the, the whole thing that, that Dorian was talking about happened within basically like two weeks of November. Uh, that, that was very, very fast. Um, and so when the new year arrived, we were um, a newborn by media standards and uh, we we're facing this, um, you know, we knew that uh, a very difficult year is kind of us. We're going to have to survive the media business. And uh, we, I think it's important to, when... how we launched the website. The... Hmm? It's important how we launched the website on December 6th. You want to talk about it? Um, I, I mean, I think the timeline is important, but um we uh, i don't think things are usually done this fast in media ever um the key post was shut down on november 8th the monday um by the end of the week the key decisions were made about the partnership with genomics about the launch of the new company um monday next then one week after that the first newsletter comes out because we were thinking like what is the simplest way what is the simplest product we can do and it's a newsletter because you just need to go on mailchimp and just start it um and that's a daily the daily newsletter that is still coming out um and then several days later podcast and then several days um later i think we came up with the name in the like, third week something like that was painful or that was the most painful thing from the beginning coming up with the name we had i think the the long list was around 200 options um and um we end up with the key independent which was kind of the option that almost nobody loved but nobody nobody really was annoyed by it nobody hated it so we well, like one thing i learned about it is from it is there is no you can come up with any name and you're gonna grow to love it like there is no instant love with the with the name it's and it's kind of the same with with design and this logo it's you kind of just grow to love them um no, I'm interested. Um, but anyway, the uh, the uh, the website that Bernard mentioned was launched less than a month after after the key post was shut down, and it was launched in a um, like <laughs> it was essentially a WordPress template. Yeah, uh, it's important to understand what we were when when the invasion started, right? Because it was a WordPress template that crashed every time. You know, too many people was in our website. Too many people was like several hundred people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was like, it was a mess. Uh, it was also launched faster than the key post relaunched. It was also a race against the Frankenstein key post. I, that need was... to, I need to address that. Yeah. I need to explain that because we haven't actually mentioned that. Um, after the owner shut down the key post and it became a huge scandal, he wanted to, to walk back from that. So he first offered us to come back, but without the chief editor. Um, and we refused. And then he what he did, he hired um, people who would relaunch the gift post as um a more obedient you know uh, team that is loyal to um to him and that is covering the government in a complementary way so so the gift post if you go to the website today it still operates it's mostly um a few extra stories so a lot of it is aggregated stories from uh news wires but there's also original content we refer to it as the zombie version of the gift post um but it still it still exists in in some form yes and we we knew that they, they are going to relaunch at some point so we were we knew that we need to act fast to be there earlier than they were it was it was important from the marketing perspective because we tried to make our story as you know visible and uh as loud as possible but it, it wouldn't matter as soon as the old key post would would go back online uh the audience would go to the old habits and go just right back uh to the old key post website and we wouldn't stand a chance so we understood that we had to uh, to be them uh and, and launch first and we did it with essential launch the website this is like kind of four days and they launched in a week after us uh well no 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 they they um they only announced the chief editor the interim chief editor became the chief editor around christmas so I don't think they will launch that fast, but but yeah. So we just we just telling you all this to kind of establish who we are and and uh, you know where we were the when, when the this invasion started. And but then of course we will be happy to answer questions about Ukraine in general as well because we 
we understand that you don't want probably to just to <laughs> think about the human department as much as we want. Um, no, but yes, I think so it's really interesting for people like, so this is where we were at when uh, the invasion started on February 24th mm -hmm. with like a startup media company, a WordPress website. You know, how many people uh, it, like tried to get access to the website on the night of the invasion? Uh, you mean like when, when it crashed? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. It, was, it went to thousands and the website just died. Tens of thousands on our website. Yeah. And, they crashed. Um, and we went from, I think, 20,000 followers on Twitter to 2 million. Yeah, yeah, it was um, four days before, before the February 24th invasion. We reached 30,000 on Twitter and we were very happy about it. Yeah, so everyone we like, messages between each other. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 30,000, so much. Um, and then and then a week later, I think it was the fun day, when, and then a couple of weeks later, it was 2 million, which is kind of where we are now. We are at 2.1 million followers, and that's, I think that's more than any media in Ukraine. Yeah, so it's like it's not only like our you guys and the whole team covering a war in the country that they they live in or or like me have you know decided is my uh, adopted home, um, but like you know this massive amount amount of responsibility now it's just like we had this huge audience, um, and it was just I remember thinking like. A, this is exciting, but it's hard to be excited about this because the reason, of course, is that there's it's this like, horrible it's like invasion. An overnight success for a very sad reason. Really sad reason, and also all this responsibility that you, you know, are you're trying to work through this, you know, a startup project. You're trying to figure things out, and all of a sudden now you are the main voice on what's happening in Ukraine, and it's kind of and you've actually in the WordPress complaint. Every time, thousand people. Yeah. And we like, you know, we we launched the news feed during when the, when the, the full scale invasion started. And actually, they were actually short feed. Oh, okay, that, that, sorry. Yeah, that, 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 that. Very good thing. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a very good thing that started, but we had just started, and so like we, I remember just trying to figure out even how you you schedule that, how you have different shifts, how you make sure that everyone's writing things the same way, you know. Like also, all of a sudden, we're in this moment learning what all these names of some of these small towns and cities are in Ukraine, also. And we're like, you know, we have to figure out how they're spelled in English. You yeah, know, there's a lot, there's a lot to, to learn in general this in, the, in, the, right. in those first days and weeks. Uh, I, um, I, I mean, I, I still get some people um, mixing up uh, a missile attack and the shelling, for example, and things like that. And uh, I, I, I didn't know because I what's, what a cruise missile is, for example. It's like uh, a lot of vocabulary to figure out that I was never planning to. To, to be figuring out. Yes, yeah, so um, just to have a timeline, when February 24 happened, we were all in Kyiv. We, uh, we did some very, very basic um, planning for in case there is an escalation or something. But we, our general expectation was, as for most people, um, was that the escalation didn't happen in Eastern Ukraine. Um, and to have Kyiv targeted the way it was targeted in those early hours of, of the 24th, that was, of course, something that none of us really expected was quite shocking. And um, so the first few days were very difficult because a lot of people were on the move, uh, taking their families to safe, safe places. Uh, most of us stayed in Ukraine. A few of us stayed in Kyiv. Uh, others went to different cities. And uh, we never stopped working when I was covering the events and uh, I don't think we slept much in those first days at all. Um, and I, is that when you stepped in? Um, mm -hmm. I stepped in on, uh, it was so February 24th when it started, it was late February 23rd here for me. And I do remember on the actual, How did, where, where were you when you I was very ill in my bedroom with COVID, COVID. extremely ill. And I, I wake up, and this is happening, and I have a hundred a fever of 104. And I checked the log and I said, Tomorrow I'm I'm with you guys, but today I said, I'm so sorry. Um, and the next so the, the 24th for me, I guess, the evening was when I started picking up evening shifts here, which is when um, or well, no, in the beginning, I think we were just, it was just around the clock for everybody. Yeah, I hadn't figured out the shift. Yeah, there were no shifts, so yeah, like, nobody was sleeping anyway. No one was, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and, and then another thing that happened, we, we told you about how the audience grew, but also um, our fundraising company totally took off, like a... No, yeah, essentially what happened, so we had everything set up, and when the war started, 
people started looking for, you know, ways to support Ukraine, but also to support Ukrainian media. Um, uh, our Twitter was growing, and you know we already had active campaigns on Patreon and on GoFundMe, so people started donating. Um, and you know I was in Kiev for the first two weeks of, uh, of the invasion, and I wasn't. It, you know it was kind of clear that I I helped to create a couple of people on the team, uh, and then I was actually I started helping the editorial because they were short-handed and yeah, obviously you know fundraising wasn't the main thing to do now. So. <laughs> Um, and then suddenly someone messaged in, in the in the Slack channel something like, have you seen like fundraise one million dollars? We're like, no. <laughs> yeah, and that was our uh, campaign that was running since the start of the Q. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, on GoFundMe, the support of it was thirty thousand dollars in fundraise. So um yeah, so it happened it was a natural thing to happen. Um I think the what really helped is that we had everything set up. Before the war, and when the war started, other media kind of started to figure out how to set up a GoFundMe campaign, how to go on Patreon, how to go on, you know, Kickstarter, whatever. Like, and we had it all smooth and running. And, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, now that you guys have been covering, yeah. like, uh, the war's been going on for uh, four to six months, and um, you know, a lot of you get this question a lot, and people seem to be really curious about how. Ukrainian journalists can remain true to journalistic mm -hmm. standards um, during during the war. And there's, I mean, certainly this war is an existential war for for Ukrainians. Um, but I personally don't don't feel that you know supporting the the government or or if not the government then then the country at war um, and the efforts to win the war means that you can't remain mm -hmm. true to those standards. Um, so I wonder, like, I'm not. I mean, I think people would be interested to hear what you think about, um, like, how you can remain true to the standards, but also why is there this kind of incessant question of, like, mm -hmm. almost, it sometimes to me appears like an accusation that Ukrainians, are, mm -hmm. it's impossible for them to remain true to standards of journalism during a war. It's just, I, I get that too. I, I was I was talking in an interview this, this morning with a German newspaper on Zoom, and uh, um, the journalist was asking me this almost this very question about about the well the freedom of speech and how to stay true to journalist standards when it's you know when you're both a citizen and 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 a journalist. Um, and I I did I was getting um, the feeling that as I was as I was given the answer which I usually give which is that our first allegiance is to to the truth and and to um, and we would never not. You know, learn it, not report something, hide something if it's if we think that it can um I don't know, tarnish the image of your brain, whatever. Like, we would never hide something. And as I was given that, I was kind of getting the feeling that he was he was right. like, mm -hmm. like not yeah, like, yeah, not really not really believing me. Um yes, yeah, so, so um it is a very strange and difficult time to be a journalist in Ukraine because um we're all figuring out where to draw the line with between being being a citizen and as Lily said, it's an existential war, it's a war for the survival of Ukraine and Ukrainians. Um and and on the other side, you're a journalist and you you need to um you know you have an obligation um before your readers to tell them the truth the, about what is happening. Um and maybe maybe sometimes the truth does not really um is is not that helpful to the Ukrainian cause. Um about three weeks ago we published an investigation about misconduct in one unit of the Ukrainian military um called International Legion and it is the unit that was started specifically for foreigners who wanted to were inspired by Ukraine's fight and wanted to come and join it and help defend Ukraine from Russia. And also we learned that there was misconduct there. Um and um we did, we did an investigation about it and we were publishing it knowing that there is going to be pushback. And there was some pushback. I mean, there were people calling us traitors on social media. Um, but we had a conversation with, with the uh, journalists doing the story before it came out and they, we just made sure that we we're on the same page about why we're doing this. And why we're doing this, this is because we, we all believe that in the long run, shedding the light on misconduct Telling the truth about your country always helps your country. It never, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. It helps your country because also the way I'm thinking, I'm always thinking about it is 
if we start tough censorship, um, or if the government starts censorship and we obey it, then we are becoming more like Russia, you know. Um, and the the essence of this war is Ukrainians not wanting to be like Russia, not wanting to live by those values, by those principles, which include censorship and no freedoms and no freedom of speech and so on. And I just think that, you know, I, I know that there are discussions in the journalistic community in Ukraine about, um, like some people believe that if you learn something about Ukraine's military um, or about the course of the fighting, that you should not report it unless you have permission of the of the military commander or something. I don't believe that personally, uh, but I know that there are people who believe that because because they think that you know for them the the, the line between civilian wait, citizen and journalist is you know they, they are much more in a citizen mode than journalist mode. Um, but I just think that if we are fighting the war the war for certain values, then we can't win this war by sacrificing some of these values. That's my way of I mean, do you want to do anything? No, I mean I, I, I think that just in the long run, um being truthful about what's going on in the country. Like to me the whole thing about journalism is like you know turning on a light in the dark room and then having people see that it's all, you know, corpses, dirt, uh, spiders and stuff, and they didn't want to see it, they hate you for it, but, you know, they start cleaning it up because they can't essentially live like that. So in the long run, it's, it's what journalism is about. It's making people see what they, you know, not often want to see, but have to see to, uh, to fix it. And, you know, the, the crisis situation, like, like war is, uh, you know, not the moment to sacrifice this kind of main mission of journalism. There's a very popular narrative, and I, I just saw somebody say it on Facebook the other day um, in Ukraine that uh, uh, all the internal, you know, fighting or arguments or figuring out who did something wrong um, in the government or in, in other communities, and that, that all all of it should wait. Um, into the victory, then you know we. The, the idea is that we uh, fight Russia, we um, defeat Russia, and then after that we look at ourselves and we, we figure out who screwed up, and you know, like in the like in the preparations of the war, or on the or during the war, or, or in any any way possible. Um, I mean, I just I just don't think that it can work. I don't think that it's that the way should be, but and it I is think... a popular. Yeah. I mean, I think some of that will happen just practically because, you know, the government, the military, journalists are occupied with covering Russian war crimes, Russian military activity, um, what's going on in the world. And so, like, it's just, it's going to happen, it will happen later, and I'm sure it will be, like, practically. But if somebody knows something or some story, you know, comes out about something, it shouldn't be covered because of this idea that, like, we'll deal with it later. You know, I mean, that's... A weird for us it seems like a weird editorial choice but it, it wouldn't uh, necessarily agree here it won't happen practically it won't happen if we don't wish it to happen <laughs> no i'm saying like, like government it'll... you know now or later government won't be like oh so now let's look at the mirror you know like sooner now later after the war whatever they will do it without us so it's a question to us whether we want to push them to do it now as we go or wait until something happens and uh, that's why that's why journalists, you know, part of the civil society, and it's also society functions with the government. Just, just one little thing I wanted to add is that because I mean, from from our experience of uh, um, you know living in Ukraine, absorbing the Ukrainian government, covering the Ukrainian government, including corruption, um, there is a very natural sense of distrust, um, like distrust in the sense of. Critical approach to whatever the government is is saying. Um, so I remember one situation when one like discussion that happened in the journalistic community about um, certain journalists not from the Kiev Independent um, learning about um, a certain fa failed operation or something like that uh, of the Ukrainian military, and they wanted to report it, but but the um, military commandment or security or somebody somebody like that told them that it is it is better very important that they don't 
that they, they can't report it. And they actually struggled them. So they said that they would be uh, arrested or something if they do it. To me, that, you know, my, my thinking, maybe this is just me being in the journalist in Ukraine for over 10 years. My thinking is, it is very likely that somebody in the military commandment or the government screwed up. This, this happened, this, you know, something failed. And they're trying to just like put it on the carpet. So my my first my first thinking my first uh, you know place I go to is not okay I trust them um it must be bad for the success of the of the uh, of the war for Ukraine. My first idea is that something something wrong there. If they're struggling to arrest journalists if they publish this information, they maybe they're just sorry covering up uh, the answers. That's even more reason to cover it if you do. Yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, if I if I were the, was the, the journalist and who was facing this dilemma, I would I would report it. Well, <coughs> There's a second side to this story. Sorry, because we were at Q and A. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other side of the reporting um, on the war in Ukraine is kind of the reporting that comes out of the West in the forty nine Ukraine. Um, and we had this conversation the other day about how the start of uh, the full scale invasion war was reported um, in uh, Western media. And uh, we actually looked it up together. You know, the big outlets, Reuters, Washington Post, New York Times, they actually reported it with the language that Russia used, which was uh, Russia, off Putin authorized a special military operation in Ukraine. Or Putin launches special Putin military. launches special military operations. Every yeah, headline had special military operations. And I mean the one with authorized, you know, it's hilarious. But um, you know, and, and Kiev Independent reported as Putin declares war on Ukraine, because that's what it was. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about this idea of like why why do you guys think it's important that outlets not use the language of of you know, Putin or any other authoritarian leader or a dictator, like, I mean, based on sort of the rules of journalistic objectivity, it might say that we should use the exact language that the person used, because that's that's how they said it, you know. Well, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, a euphemism, right? So that, that's not how I understand human subjectivity. I understand human subjectivity as reporting the, the, the facts, not, not in the words that, you know, because, um, I think when when I, when I was uh, saying earlier that uh, what we uh, bring to to the mix is uh, local perspective on reporting from Ukraine, I think that that's what worked. That, that's why our headline was "We Need to Go because I mean we were all in key. Um, I was not sleeping that night. I was listening to to Putin's address, and um, so were several other editors, and we were texting each other about it in the in the um, group chat. And we were saying it was a long address, like 20 minutes it was where Putin was talking about basically how um, Ukraine's existence is a mistake and uh, uh, it fix it. And we were talking, I remember we were saying to each other, this doesn't sound like he's gonna at the end, he's just gonna announce some some you know escalation in the in eastern Ukraine. This sounds like a you know full out uh declaration of war because that, that's like going so far. And then he stops speaking, and um, and then he says these words: "We are launching special military operation to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine." And because I'm in Ukraine and I'm there, and after immediately after he stopped speaking, the explosions were heard in the sky, and immediately videos started coming in from the border where uh, convoys of Russian tanks were crossing from the north and from the south from Crimea. Um. I had this I had this little moment of, of doubt, like um I put in this headline, put in Glass War in Ukraine. I had a little moment of doubt because it's a very big headline. It's a very, you know, once in a lifetime thing that you can write. And hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Um and I was thinking, okay, he said special military operation, but wait a minute, wait a minute. There are explosions that are here in the sky that are apparently something hidden hitting my city. There are troops coming in. There is a word for that. And it's a very obvious word, it's war. It's not special military operation. And because the dictator wants to call it special military operation, it's not our job to please him and to, to you know, um, transmit his words exactly as they are. Because what's next, you know, tomorrow he's gonna, he's gonna 
you know, play, play with the language in a different way and, uh, and uh, you know, <coughs> say, it, say it's white or well, it's black and I'm gonna, I'm gonna report that it's white. And th mean, that's what the Russian journalists did for like 30 years and look where it got them. Pretty much nowhere, you know, they, they said, you know, we have to, to be able to report on what's going on in our country, we have to make concessions and, and this and that, then we have, they actually use the language where, where their government used them and look at them. You know, it's not the way to go. Really. Yeah, I mean, I think even we, we probably put the words do not supply in the in the uh, article about Putin declaring war, but after that, we don't use that word. I mean, we don't. We don't yeah, it's very, I think it's very responsible to use that without explaining it right. immediately that, right. that it, uh, mm -hmm. it's fiction that exists in, uh, um, in the mind of Putin and, and the Russian propagandists. Right. So we don't even put it in quotations usually, right? Because we don't I mean even putting any quotations isn't exactly explaining that, you know, this is a fiction of this these crazy people's mind. They actually I think um you know for a while I thought that they dropped it too. They they stopped you know talking about demilitarization and gentrification of Ukraine. But then I watched something on Russian TV. I mean I didn't watch it on Russian TV. It was a fragment that was uh making rounds on social media because it was a Russian talk show um with you know, these speakers struggling to explain to the audience why Russia is withdrawing from Ukraine, because that's what happened several days ago. Ukraine made a, uh, conducted a very successful counteroffensive in, in the eastern part of the country and actually pushed Russia out of uh, a big, big chunk of the territory. So now the Russian TV needs to explain how that was, that could happen, and they're trying to find somebody to blame. Um, and, and I actually heard that phrase that this, this person, um, Saying that the the Nazi regime of Zelensky needs to be toppled, mm -hmm. I was like, "Wow, they still on that?" They did, they did let it go for a while when they, you know, when their uh, full scale invasion um, did not go as planned because as many you know, it's going to go another three day war. The three day invasion has lasted now two hundred and two days, and I forget. Um, and so they stopped kind of using this language because it wasn't effective because they weren't, they weren't reaching their goals at all. Um, and, but they kind of come back to it a little bit. Actually, speaking of this counteroffensive and, and uh, the, the, you know, Russia's essentially you know, uh, failing, uh, hopefully failed uh, full-scale invasion. Like we also had this conversation about how it's been reported um, in, in, in Western press. And it's been really interesting to see how Ukraine liberates territories when it, can, it conducts a counteroffensive. So we report it as Ukraine liberates X amount of territories. In the New York Times, the headline is literally Russia loses territory. I don't understand. How, I mean, in what universe has Russia lost territory yeah. in Ukraine? You know? um, and so I, I, maybe we go like the bill. I mean, yeah, once we, you know, yeah. Um, but I think I think that you know, like it's really interesting that there's still a tendency to see this as something that Russia is losing as it when it when it retreats from territory in Ukraine, and not a gain that Ukraine is making in its magic territory, but that it isn't freeing or liberating its people. You know, I, I don't know what you guys think of that. And I mean, we, we talk about it a lot. It's the the Russia centric perception of this part of the world that has been on for for ages, and I think that's why that's why. Um, I don't have a story about that. How uh, in the in the beginning, the Western media so much they, they didn't believe that Ukraine can fight back because they had this um, they had this uh, you know vision of, of the Russian army being so great that it there is no way you know they, they barely who have barely heard about Ukraine. It's like something, something somewhere. I mean, I've been I've been traveling like uh, for for years and. Uh, Every once in a while, I run into a person who, when I say that I'm from Ukraine, asks me, "So, what the weather is like in Moscow now?" Um, <laughs> or something like that, or they think that it's some, somehow attached to Russia. And this this Russia-centric um, uh, view is what made people believe that that Ukraine is going to be going to perish. Uh, basically, and have the story. Yeah, it, it, it's like it's also very business side. Think about it. They invested in Moscow bureaus for like decades and decades. They never it's had like Western, Europe, uh, the media. Me, Western media, yeah, 
big Western media holding companies. Mm -hmm. So everybody had a Western, you know, the Moscow Bureau, Washington Post had it, I guess, the Reuters had it, like no, no Financial no. Times had it. Yeah, no, no one had. Like best case scenario, every port in Ukraine, you know, and probably not even that. So and now they look at Ukraine and the at the regions will be Moscow. Um that's that that's just logical. That's what happens. It's a natural thing to happen if you if you have the headquarters in Moscow for so long. And they they can't change it very quickly. And that's you know, that's where these weird headlines like Russia loses land in Ukraine uh come from. Um and we need to like I think part of our you know being on tour um, and talking to people is is actually kind of combating that narrative because that that has to stop and that's uh, you know our job to make to help it stop but also you know uh you guys international journalists to change the lens finally but the the story <laughs> the story i had was actually a german i think it was german i think german reporter calling me um like on i don't know day seven of the duration um and talking to me about independent and how we're handling it and you know i'm in kiev i, I live in a balloon being also part of the uh city it's closer to which i am being in that um it's like very loud in my uh apartment and uh, she's calling me and like yeah so what will you do as a manager when Kiev falls i'm like he won't fall She's like, yeah, but as the manager, <laughs> what will you do when Kiev falls? And she repeated like three times. And I hung up and wrote like the big letter to her editor saying like, well, this is wrong for so many reasons. First of all, you know, this is a wrong assumption. And we, Kiev Independent, reported on that a couple of times even before the war that we don't believe that Kiev would fall in three days. So before interviewing us, you could also read our website for once. And then, you know, second thing is, you are talking to people who are living through a trauma as you speak to them. You can say shit like that. I am in Kiev now. If you know, if Kiev you falls, it's probably not. I'm probably be that, you know. Uh, and well, what do you want me to say? Well, as a manager, when Kiev falls, you know, I think I'll, you know, make pancakes and I don't know, I mean, probably call my parents to say goodbye. Well, you cake your eyes or whatever. Like, <laughs> I, I, this is like a very weird you know thing to to ask but also like the other bad thing that is happening is that what well, now people have started talking about ukraine and people have no clue what ukraine is and that's also why they thought that key would fall in three days if they knew ukrainian history they would know that she would fall in three days and then the Parisian yeah and, and then another great person also uh, you know uh, journalists were so ignorant in the beginning so the, uh, i i left kiev on day 11 or 12 of the invasion um and it was a very normal day for me because i was trying to convince my parents to leave and they were all i'm dying at home you know and i i had to work and it was impossible to worry because curfew was on for days i had a dog i had to walk in there was street fights and stuff so i had to leave and i'm like making this very you know hard decisions in the morning and there's a journalist calling me and it's like uh hi where are you i'm like i'm in kiev trying to evacuate and she's like yeah um do you know that they hit the the bridge of our plant i'm like yeah and she's like how did you find out about that from the news it's like yeah but did you hear the explosion I'm like yeah i saw it from my window <laughs> in kiev and so you know that but it's yeah. like maybe 600 kilometers away from kiev and, and miles maybe, I, don't I, don't I don't know 400 miles I think. yeah it's it's like <laughs> But you could just look at the map, like, you know, yeah, like and far. see where Kiev and where Zaporizhia is. Yeah, I couldn't probably hear that. Uh, and that's that's the level of you know what people knew about. It. So it's very easy for them to make mistakes, like assume that people would fall, that you know, um, that I don't know. Uh, since the war, since the invasion started, you know, Ukrainian speaking. Ukrainians will just go over their Russian speaking Ukrainians. That's what the people do in Ukraine, right? This wild, wild west or something. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, and also it's part of our own mission to change this, right? We need to fix this, yeah, fill in these gaps uh, and kind of give people more context about Ukraine and the region. 
That's what we're doing here at the Army Institute as well. Uh, I think we'll move uh, to the Q and A portion. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'll start off with a quick but two pronged question. You were giving us the history of how you set up the Cave Independent. Just uh, a couple of things you mentioned, uh, and this is to all of you. Um, you know, the, the initial readership of the Cave Post, we talked about the business community, and I, I, I remember when it was first appearing, seemed to be aimed at uh, expats, yes, living uh, in Cave, because that's where most of the expats were back then, and they needed this language in English. How has that changed now? Because now you have a whole generation of Ukrainians like yourselves who know English very well. And do they, do you know what percentage is like, do you know how often Ukrainian readers who understand Ukrainian uh, you know, or Russian uh, turn to you as a source? I mean, Ukraine is not just expat. How, how has that changed? Uh, I would think that it has in 30 you know, or so years. And the second part of the question, you mentioned uh, going through 200 options for the name. And also going back and looking back at the cave posts and looking back at the early years of independence, you know, everything was so concentrated in cave and everything was about cave and uh, it's understood why this was done for good or bad, but, uh, and all the expats were in cave. And again, that has changed over years. You have people all over the country now and God willing this world and soon and you're gonna have people from all over the world moving to Ukraine to help rebuild it in some of these regions, which are not in cave. Uh, did you ever consider one of the 200 names that not have cave in the title? Oh, most of them did not have cave. Most, title, of them. most of them, yeah. There were many. I, I was insistent that it should be two for readers to recognize or to make the connection. We each have either Ukraine or cave in the title. I would prefer for Ukrainian title, but there are no options that that really works there. Um, we think I think Ukraine Daily was uh was somewhere like maybe the runner up to the game independent. Um, and uh, there the were pretty good options that didn't have either Ukraine or Kiev in it. I'm not gonna even, even go there. Um, it's, uh, we had we had a like a committee which was a separate chat. People who were delegated from the from the twenty something person team to to choose the name. It's, uh, it, it took days. It was horrible. I never want to go through it again. Um, yeah, but answering answering your your first. Mm -hmm. Well, well, but but to be clear, we definitely don't want to focus on Kyiv. Um, you're right, the Kyiv Post, when it started in, back in, in the 90s, it was initially an expert newspaper, then it grew international. Um, we know, but we, we are definitely not focusing not just on Kyiv, but we're not only focusing on Ukraine, we're actually um, exploring the region. We are uh, doing constant coverage of Belarus now because we believe that Belarus is really overlooked uh, in the English, uh, you know, speaking world. And uh, Belarus played a very important role in this uh, in this invasion. Um, so we are doing a weekly newsletter about Belarus in English, which I mean, probably the one the one there. Are there any? Uh, there's um, there's one but newsletters not about Belarus as extensive and and. We have Belarus articles, you know, almost weekly, and like we've noticed, they they do really well. Um, they get a yeah. lot. Of, they're doing extreme, and I think it's because there's a there's a a lack of Belarus coverage. So if anybody has it, all the people that are interested in Belarus are, are going to be reading it. Um, but yeah, there's we're really trying to, and because we just because we believe that locals bring um, ever necessary perspective. People who are writing about Belarus are, are from Belarus. Uh, I mean, they're not physically in Doros now because it would be putting them uh, in danger, you know, assigning stores to them while they're um, in there. It's a very dangerous place now for journalists. Uh, but but they're Doros and they're from Doros. And, and answering your uh, first question about uh, whether um, Ukrainians are coming to us, the short answer is uh, not often, but it, it's becoming more often. And it's, uh, um, you know, the key post, for example, what I learned in the, what the, the last few years is that um, quite few Ukrainians actually read it constantly, actually, actually went to it as their go to source of news, very few. Um, but, um, but when it collapsed, it became clear how big of a name it was, how big of a meaning it had for, for Ukrainians. Uh, and and that, I think that's similar to what is happening to us. We are um, a very, we're seen as a very important component in Ukraine's media space, and uh, um, you know, as part of as part of uh, Ukraine's effort to you know, to to become uh, a better place, basically. 
but we are not necessarily people with Ukrainians go to sort of news because there are, I mean, I want to give credit to my colleagues in who are, um, in other Ukrainian media, but that there are there are many uh, very good sources there. And, okay. the, and like uh, I I don't see how the name Kim Independent making us Kiev centric. Like I mean, the New York Times is not on New Yorker. That was exactly the argument to like somebody somebody gave when we were discussing the names. Somebody, uh, somebody we, said somebody that was in New York Times. Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. <laughs> Will be the capital of Ukraine uh, as long as it stands, and we know it for only three days, so it you know, kind of has a history in the future. So I think the Cuban independent name is uh, is a great name. I wasn't a fan. I like the weird one. I also I hated Cuban independent. I was like I was you know messaging people individually, being like, no way, we can't we can't have that. It's it's uh, it sounds horrible. And then now it's like I couldn't imagine any other way. I mean, not just because of the war, but. Just it's so perfect and perfect for us. And, yeah, I think it's here to stay. Uh, well, let's move to our questions now. I'll take two questions from here, and then we have uh, people, you know, listening on and watching online. Let's be careful, uh, watching online as well. Uh, and there will be uh, you can uh, post your questions through Zoom and through YouTube, and then I'll read them. But let's start with the people that make the trek here. And please announce who you are before you. Yes, I'm Yuri Sutsky, Ukrainian here at Columbia University. Uh, I have uh, uh, one question is that uh, there is a kind of a postulate in uh, cognitive linguistics that uh, believing that people are intellectually equipped to draw correct conclusions if they're given the facts is a falsehood. That's not true. We can give up all the facts to the people, objective, but they will still draw the wrong conclusion because what's important is the framing of the message. And the framing of the, of the message is something that I think Ukrainian media do not give uh, enough attention to. So the message, the war was framed both by Ukrainian media up until now as ATO, as anti-terrorist anti operation, which was both misleading and self-defeating. Now, how you frame the message is really important. Do you think uh, Ukrainian media are serious enough about not only reporting the facts, but also framing the message that is not reactive to Russian framing. Because what I see on Ukrainian media most of the time is that a great 95% of commentators, analysts say, quote, what is said in Moscow and then debunk it. Mm -hmm. Then again, it's more you negate it, the more you reinforce that message that you want to negate. If you ask George Laiko, uh, this guy, who was the of these things. So in that, in that sense, Ukrainian media actually participates and reinforces Russian messages unintentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very interesting question. So um, immediately about um, your point about Russia, uh, about Ukrainian media space being reflective, yes, it is reflective, it is very reflective of what Russia said. At the same time, um, I think you need to remember that uh, a lot of Ukrainians are exposed to what is said in Russia. People understand the language, people, some, many people speak the same language, and there's still, there's a lot of, even with all the bans of Russian websites and so on, there's a, uh, a lot of exposure of Ukrainians to, to Russian, um, you know, media landscape, to what Russia says. And in this regard, I keep seeing people, um, you know, for example, whenever Dmitry Peskov, who is the spokesman for Vladimir Putin, says something about Ukraine, it is reported on Ukrainska Pravda as the news item. Ukrainska Pravda is the, the biggest news site in Ukraine. Um, and I often see people saying this shouldn't be there. Um, why are we picking what, what, what somebody was just a, um, you know, it's obviously not ever saying a word of truth. Um, I think, but I think we can't believe it without an answer because Ukrainians are exposed to the same messages. Because if you, if a Ukrainian person reads, doesn't read the Ukrainian stuff out that, um, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go on, I'm not going to go and check Russian news, but some people will. Some people are exposed to it. Some people send links by their, you know, um, family members, some of whom are in Russia. So with that exposure, I think uh, what Russia says needs to be answered because you mentioned this uh, belief that 
you know, trying to uh, amplify the message by answering them. At the same time, you know, I know there is a school club that in uh, list uh, your role that thinks that um, if you leave a negative message about yourself unanswered, then it's only their side of the story that exists in the public space and your side is not represented. So it's a very difficult, difficult question, but I, I, um, I do think that the framing of the message, different media are definitely trying to, to frame the message. There are different different techniques, different things that they pick up, including your personal how many media write Russia from the from the you know uh, don't capitalize it to you know Putin don't capitalize it and so on. Um which is also kind of framing the message kind of you know adding this this little element of humiliation Russia with with in, in the headline or something, which I believe is is um uh, not necessarily, or maybe even self-defeating, because with everything that Russia is doing with Bucha and all the atrocities and everything, it's it's humiliating itself, you know. Um, and we should just yeah, anyway. Um, but I don't think that Ukrainian media are very skilled in framing the message. And I think it's because it's a general problem with the, the media market is quite poor financially. The, it's the turnover of people is quite the, the threshold to enter this field is very low. So it's a lot of uh, um, it's basically a lot of young, exhausted, uh, inexperienced people writing this news that you see. So it's not it's not a very sophisticated operation. It's uh, um, those competing against each other. There is not a lot of you know sophisticated thinking put into that. I mean, I but, I hope but not so and, and I agree that we can't. We can just ignore Russia's messaging because a lot of uh, we like in in our bubble we believe that people are going to you know media websites and that's how they get the information but that's not how uh, you know my mom sends me um, messages sends me messages from Telegram groups and chats like weird stuff and it all has you know Putin's quotes Peskov's quotes whatever I I don't know where she gets it but she's like is that true are they going to like bomb we all out tomorrow. I'm like uh, what? <laughs> you know, I haven't seen it anywhere, but that's that keeps happening. So if we if we ignore that, you know, people will still consume it just without our uh, uh, commentary. So but that was not my suggestion. Ignoring it. my suggestion was thinking how you can message in such a way that Russians switch from aggression to defense and start mm -hmm. defending themselves about certain messaging that you generate. And I think Ukrainians have not done a very good job doing that. Because how how often do you hear Skaberieva and the like justifying themselves and defending against any kind of messaging that originates from here? I think they do now. I think they do now. Uh, well, I don't know about Skaberieva per se, uh, but uh, um, they, they are more on the defense now with uh, um, you know, I've, I've heard them speaking about uh, basically defending defending themselves, defending Russia against the uh, the you know narrative of um, Russia being the one that started. But they they've been doing that from the very beginning. They've been trying to justify um, why they started it with things like Ukraine was provoking or whatever. Now they're defending um, themselves against uh, um, the counteroffensive success. Um, and they, you know, how they do, you know, they work with this challenge themselves and the readers. They they are making up news about uh, 10,000 American Marines being deployed to uh, like a small town in Kharkiv, always. Uh, Bolkhia, I think it was a little bit mm -hmm. else. Bolkhia, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And, <laughs> and that's that's how they do. They they now now the messaging is that we are losing because it's not Ukraine we are fighting. It's, it's actually the whole strengths of uh, of NATO that we are fighting. So they are, I mean, also they are they're not talking to us. They are talking to their own people. Their message is that to 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 Russian, and Russians are you know forgive God forgive they're just like vegetables at this point, you know, and and they. Uh, you know, it's not like they are receptive to whatever we are saying or you know, foreign press is saying. They have one kind of information. And that's what Skadeva is talking about. And Skadeva is not talking to us. It's not like so. Ukraine has that. I have to, you know, like give another message. No, it's not really that. They just have to find reasons to, for, for you know, sorry, their uh, society to believe it. I bet millions of Ukrainians listen to Skadeva. 
We had a question here that we have to go online for questions, yes. So ever since uh, the war started, I've been pretty much glued to my phone at all times. Not now, but um, online there's just this avalanche, just misinformation, and just the deep hatred of these kind of people who couldn't even point out where your claim was on the map. And there's all kinds of crazy things going on about uh, you know, this is the fight Jewish Ukrainian Nazis that are drug drug addicts and they're working with the United States to make biolabs and they're going to send birds to Russia to like make them sick and like all of this stuff and people just eat it, eat it up. And there are people, a lot of Americans especially, who just absorb all this information. They just develop these like comically like awful thoughts about Ukraine and Ukrainians. And they'd go out and they use their platforms to sort of spread it. So in the sense that there, yes, there is a physical war, but there's also this informational war that's going on. And as it in, in the newspaper, you guys are sort of on the forefront of that, on the front lines of fighting that. What is there a strategy when it comes to that? I know that there's a initiative of explaining mm -hmm. events in Ukraine, uh been mm -hmm. talking about, you know, people will call something a coup, but it's like, no, here's what actually that kind of stuff. So, so um, I think that disinformation is the biggest problem of our generation. And I think that nobody, as of now, nobody knows how to actually tackle that. Um, it is um, the problem with, with all the strategy that exists, uh, well, almost all that exist, uh, is that they are all um, not really penetrating the bubble of the people who are that. So the, the most natural thing is, uh, and we've been trying that too, um, is to do, let's say, more explanatory journalism to to debunk certain things, to to put out very simple written um, and you know well well sourced stories that explain um, certain things um, and combat those narratives. But the thing is, um, they rarely reach the people who are, as you said, you know, they just learned about the Ukraine's existence, they learned about something about um, Jewish Nazi drug addicts, uh, Ryan, I think that's all the landscape, by the way, like, <laughs> that's how they describe him, yeah, the Russians, um, and, uh, and, and they spread it. That person, when they see a headline that challenges their worldview that you know let us explain to you why you've been wrong this you know in, in Berlin that are they really gonna you know out of curiosity clip on that or are they gonna go watch Netflix? I mean I think they're gonna go watch Netflix because that's that's enjoyable and it's not enjoyable to nobody nobody will nobody actively seeks to be proven wrong. So that's the problem with all the strategies of company in this room that, that exists that has the balance. You know, the, the main conversation now is around how to, how to penetrate their bubbles. But it's um, it, it's extremely complicated because it's also a human nature to to be doing what you described. Um, something motivates people to do that. Um, you know, people want to be in on a secret. People want to feel like they know the truth that somebody's hiding from them. Who want to be the messengers who are bringing the, this truth to people. That's why people like, uh, um, you know, messenger apps are huge uh, you know, disseminators of propaganda. Why? Because of disinformation. Because a person says something, and their first instinct is to tell their close the community that. So that is why things like parent, parent, or parents, uh, like saying to the children. Ch no, no, you know, chats for parents. Um, I'm just trying to think of like what are the most common like this this community yeah, don't how to chat. The chat or, like the residents of a building, or the yeah, residents yeah, yeah, of yeah, parents of a class. class. Yeah. 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 yeah, somebody and somebody will send to the chat like hey, hey guys, you know that actually like yeah. something, something. But but you believe it. Frankly, I think that uh, so there are a lot of levels of the information and that you know weird stuff about you know pigeons being sent to Russia to whatever and you know Jewish Nazi. Uh, is the least harmful of those because the others are actually more harmful and the others lay much deeper. The others are uh, integrated into the intellectual discussions. They are targeting people who are actually well-educated and, you know, kind of in our bubble. 
more often than not, I, I, I meet people in the US and in other countries who repeat Russian information, but in a very sophisticated way. You wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be bullshit about, you know, a patient. Of course not who believe that, but like it's uh, an old journalist, like an interior journalist from the US asked me, uh, in all seriousness, like, don't you think that uh, this law that now to get a Ukrainian citizenship, people need to actually pass a Ukrainian language exam is, uh, you know, uh, yeah, there, like, so discriminate, if discriminating Russian speaking, you know, Ukrainians or yeah, Russian speaking people in Ukraine, like, <laughs> like, so how is that, you know, uh, almost every country has that. You know, like in France, they have to also uh, pass a political exam and like social studies and stuff, also language tests on a very high level. And then suddenly, if it happens in Ukraine, that discrimination against Russian speakers, what? Like, and that's it. And he's not a believer into the, you know, pigeons uh, and stuff. He's a smart guy, like a journalist in the US and probably in the Bannon newspaper or whatever, but like not a stupid person. So that that layer of disinformation is, you know, that's much more harmful than that. And I think it's also hard to find the strategy, but part of that is, I think, the, you know, kind of the, the diplomacy that we do, like we go around, we talk to people and we tell them, you know what, it's not really what it is, you know, meet a real Ukrainian, shake your hands. Like talk to them about how it really is in Ukraine where you haven't been for the game and stuff, where you just heard from, or more, you know, read about in the New York Times that thing Russia was just started to Ukraine, you know. Like that that has to be tackled, but it's a, you know, there is, you know, Olga says it's like finding cure for cancer. Okay, so I will try to get to some of the questions online. I'll skip through the ones that we've covered, uh, at least partially, just because there's a lot and we want to get some more in the writing out of space. One question, anonymous, this is the second part of a long question. What are your long-term revisions for the Cave Independent? Are you going to try to develop one axis more? In other words, photo editing, a certain theme. And another one from Hannah Banks. How is journalism adapting to news happening at the speed of Twitter? So, I guess that was what was that about photo editing? Uh, so what is your long-term ambition for the cave? Are you going to try to develop one access more than another? Photo editing, a theme, like do you have any kind of specific uh, um, ideas for how you want to develop? Just for what I'm Yeah, the the LED one the the one for the future one. What is the what is the vision for developing the cave development? Yeah, so essentially our big plan is to uh, start covering not just Ukraine but the region. Uh, we already started to Belarus, and we will move into Central Asia, we'll go to, you know, and try to fill the information gaps that are there. But we also want to go on more platforms uh, and and be you know be available to to our readers, you know, different age uh, social groups and stuff in different countries and different platforms. Like we have a big plan to go on TikTok, for example. Um, you know, we try to stay away, but I think there's no way we can. Um, yeah, we've been discussing to, you know, to go on all the plans soon. Not what you think about, but- uh, no, it's, it's such a brilliant idea, don't give it away. No, I won't. But, um, <laughs> and, you know, like we have a lot of, so we believe that we need to be on as many platforms as possible, but at the same time, we, uh, Business-wise, we want to uh, go in de develop other revenue streams. Uh, we want to have an e-store soon, for example. That's that's a big plan. But we also want to create alliances and partnerships with uh, for distribution and and content sharing. Um, the big uh, the big beginning for us now is the video department. So we are trying to build the video department and uh, work more in the individual format. Um, what else is there? We are also working this podcast, so we'll have a, a hopefully a good partnership with a professional podcast company in the UK, and uh, they will help us produce the audio products. Um, a lot of things are, you know, we are trying to business-wise also, we are trying to bring membership model to our website from Patreon because we're losing a lot of money in between and we want and we also don't have personal data on a lot of our users and that's important for marketing and distribution so we are trying to build that but we're also trying to be you know like to follow the tech tech developments and innovations and um, use it as much 
uh, you know, operations as possible. Um, kind of a little bit vague at, at this point because our main focus remains to cover the world. Um, but as much as we can, we are trying to still have a strategy um, because we've seen what happened to Belarus independent media. They essentially were in the survival mode for years. And then, you know, it was just too late to have a strategy. Essentially, so we don't want to fall into that trap. We kind of have this shorter term but still a strategy uh, where we define our next steps, business wise, uh, but also editorial wise. Uh, okay, thank you. We have two minutes left, so maybe we'll take two questions from from the from the audience of Ambassador Kaczynski and <coughs> anybody else. Have, yes, uh -huh. <coughs> thank you. <coughs> quickly, though. Yes, very quickly. Thank you very much for information. Really. Well, first of all, I want to remind you that speaking about the Dagens, the newspaper that existed before Kiev Post was called News from Ukraine. News from Ukraine. Yes. yes. Um, and the editor was a Canadian, William Bailey. It's before it was before the independence. Yeah. So just before the independence. Yes, yes, it's yeah. that because there were also English. Was it published in Canada or in, in no, Ukraine? In Kiev. Oh, in Kiev. 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 Yes, everything was done. Well, this is the first. The second, about the image framing and the content. You raised this question about uh, some people not being happy with the publishing something. Just to want to give you more detail. The success of the operation uh, in Kharkiv one of the details was that it was completely secret. Even the office of the president, the staff, were not informed. It was completely military. And the general chief of staff was the one responsible for the whole operation. So this is something about the content about sharing. And then uh, definitely, you have a great future. I wish you all the best. Thank you. We had a question back here. Thank you. It's an amazing event and it opened the whole abyss of different problems and power imbalances and challenges that we have to face. And thank you also for bringing this personal and professional uh, all together and showing how entangled they are during the wartime and how we cannot escape from other bodies because they're usually like, uh, we, we are seen as, um, well, as transparent creatures who just write text, but still we are really embedded in the situation when you have to escape uh, and save your children, save your parents. Uh, and this multiplicity of roles is really important to, uh, to be aware of. And my question is a bit about this self-censoring, and I would like to push it a bit further. Still, like, uh, you are really about the values of professionalism here, but what are the red lines for you, probably? What would be the things that you will definitely not talk about during the war? Mm -hmm. And even more, uh, how the ethics of journalism is reshaped uh, through these experiences. For instance, uh, all the reporting of war crimes and interactions with people who actually live through these war crimes, who might be the uh, victim of rape, who might have seen the death of their loved ones. So uh, it might be linked a bit to this parachuting journalism that you mentioned and all these practices of fixers who are coming and working in you know, a bit of extractive way, exploiting mm -hmm. way. So if you can reflect a bit on the self-censoring and access, mm -hmm. so on the, on the self-censoring one, I think the, the, the only real line that I can think of immediately is if, if for some reason I obtain a folder that uh, lays down uh, like, let's say it's uh, September 1st, and the folder lays out the plan for the archive counteroffensive, um, and it's completely secret, and I'm, I'm not gonna go and publish and, and have a headline, you know, Ukraine's gonna attack uh, Russia in a in secret operation, <laughs> read all about it, you know. That's, that's a good news. <laughs> well, but significant, what is, what is the, um, what is really the public interest there? I mean, uh, at the same time, for example, to give you an we had this conversation with um, was was one of the journalists uh, some time ago. Uh, what we the question we were debating was what would we do if we obtain 
um, a document that reveals the real uh, casualties of Ukrainian military up until now, because we don't know them. The Ukrainian uh, government is not uh, revealing this data, uh, which I'm told is, is, is quite normal for military time. But if I, let's say, as a journalist, I um, leak this document, somehow I have, somehow I know that it's, it's, it's you know, the, the real one is genuine. Yes, so I, you know, I have, I'm able to verify it. And let's say the document is um, uh, is shocking. Let's say that it's more than we, we all expected. Do I publish it understanding that it can, understanding the devastating effect that it can have on on Ukrainians, learning that way more of Ukrainian soldiers were killed than they assumed? Yes, I'm going to publish it. Because I believe it is the public interest, so they have the right to know. Okay, I want to get one more question online. Uh, Timur Donets, hi, I would like to, I would, I would be glad to know your perspective on specifically war reporting, which is not really happening. I don't see any official war reporters on the front line from the Ukraine side, while the Russians are very often are accompanied by their propaganda crews. Why is that so? And is there a chance for a change? Thank you. I think the answer is kind of in the question. <laughs> yeah, the propaganda crews and uh, uh, Ukrainian journalists are not that. Um, it is it is difficult to get access now for for journalists to for Ukrainian journalists to the front line right? because um, just because of how dangerous it is. Even if um, so, the procedure is it's it's kind of difficult and complicated in different in different parts. But the procedure is you have to have the accreditation. You have to have um, basically um, often some permission from somebody on you know at the top. For you to go somewhere, but then what it goes down to is is you have to have the permission of a of a commander of a certain small unit to you know to accept you to be embedded with them for a day or two at the front line, basically to take a responsibility, to take for, responsibility your for you. And that's that's where the rejection usually happens they, because they don't want to take responsibility. It's not it's 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 not a like a scheme or a plan to limit access. It's just that these people are. Um, you know, they're going to be in trouble with the, with their commanders if a journalist is killed uh, while embedded with them. Um, and it's it's an artillery order war. It's not it's not like you, you know, you can you can make sure that the journalist is safe by not just not letting them go past that line. No, it's, it's you know, a shallow, a shallow missile can come anywhere. So uh, there is no, yeah, so it's... And, and also, it's like, very limited. If you think about it, so what what Russian propaganda crew wants to do? They want to parade their military power, right? That's why they're following their military everywhere. And so, what do we show? So we go to the front line, and there is Ukrainian unit, and they fire artillery over somewhere in ten kilometers. And what's the additional well? What's the added value of that? Like, you know, we come to this, you know, place, and then Ukrainian. Um, military fired there totally in end of the story. Like, I don't know. I mean, uh, is it worth risking like a life of a journalist and a military unit, you know, to to say that? I think there are there are exceptions when something grand's happening or like the counteroffensive is now, you know, there are liberated towns and and our reporters are there, like, and all the reporters are there, like, seeing what happened where Ukrainian citizen towns were occupied. But what was the point of just being there when it wasn't going? I mean, it, it would be an interesting story. I can, I can prompt you the point, for instance, I know from first hand sources mm -hmm. that there were cases when Ukrainian commanders were not together with their units. They were 30 kilometers inside of their of Ukrainian territories and their units were literally without commanders, not knowing what to do. And the commander would give them commands over the phone. That's a story, I think. And, I and that's a story that needs to be reported. There were yeah. stories again firsthand. Yeah, but you don't have to be there to report that story. I think you do. Thank you. Uh, it's it depends. It actually, actually, it was part of the the investigation I mentioned so that just came out of about three weeks ago about misconduct. Some of it was was about that about commanders being responsible, sending people to what what they describe as suicide missions mm -hmm. and, uh, without backup, without anything. Um, our reporters were not there for when it happened. What they did was they talked to a huge number of people who were in this unit and who could could you know could tell the same story basically. Um, it is. Um, it would be 
I mean, ideally, ideally, yes, um, it would be good for journals to be there and see it firsthand. In the real world, with that specific situation, it's it's almost it almost never can happen because it is the commander who who allows the who you know who needs to to permit the journals to gain. So I guess the commander would not you know do it if there is something shady going on or if he's like somewhere safe in the back and he's sending people there. But ideally, yeah, in the real world, um we would probably learn about something like that from talking to many, many people after after the fact. We also should remember that like you know heroism is great but good journals it's you know a living one and if you risk your life or something that you can get otherwise uh, and there is a big chance that you can get killed and you know and it's also just your life and i that um risking journals i mean risking sending a journals to um a very to, to an er eric still just some guy it's not just that they can be killed is uh if they are taken captive a, they're facing torture. Uh, B, they are very valuable um, hostages for uh, prison exchange. And they, you know, Russians can use them basically in negotiating to, to get somebody, somebody important that you finance to. So it's, you know, there's separate components there. Okay, we have to wrap it up. We're over time already. I want to thank everybody online uh, who listened in and watched this, everybody who came today. Thank you so much for coming. Please do come to our upcoming events. And I uh, really want to uh, thank our three participants, our speakers today, for talking about how you set up uh, this new source, how it evolved, and how it's all the various questions. And thank you for the questions on how, you know, what it is to report in Ukraine in a time of war and all the complexities of that. Uh, so thank you to Olga Rodenko, Elena Shevchenko, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Something, uh, if you if you enjoyed this, if you you know after listening to what we had to say, if you believe in independence, you can become a member. You can go to the website and there's the bottom on top and you can pledge like five dollars a month. And you know, you'll have these events exclusive to you one to one. Actually, yes, we do have online events exclusive to members with QAs with, with our reporters, and it's like in depth. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.